the Happy Scientist Podcast. Each episode is designed to make you more focused, more productive, and more satisfied in the lab. You can find us online at bitesizebio.com slash happy scientist. Your hosts are Kenneth Vogt, founder of the executive coaching firm Vera Claritas, and Dr. Nick Oswald, PhD, bioscientist, and founder of Bite Size Bio. Hello and welcome to the Happy Scientist podcast from Bite Size Bio. If you want to become a happier, healthier and more productive scientist, you are in the right place. I'm Nick Oswald, the founder of BitesizeBio.com and with me is the driving force of this podcast, Mr. Kenneth Vogt, my friend, mentor and founder of the coaching company Vera Claritas. Today's episode is called, When Should I Speak Up? So Ken, speak up. What's this all about? All right. Well... I was I was thinking about this the other day because Nick, you brought something up about this, and it's funny you put it in my head and then forgot you did so. <laughs> okay, but or didn't realize. <laughs> it, yeah, well, I mean this this is kind of what happens sometimes. You know, there's something that we notice, and we set something in motion that really can matter that that can make things happen. So you got to decide when do I do that and when do I not do that because there are times when to do so can can be problematic, can be even dangerous, can be harmful to your career. You know? um, it can be harmful to friendships uh, or, or other relationships. But then there are other times when to not speak up, they would cause other problems for you. you know, something you really care about and you don't bother to speak up and then something goes wrong and you'll you forever are beating yourself about, man, I should have said something. I could have made a difference. I, I could have stopped this thing from this negative thing from happening. So, so the question is, when should I speak up? So really we're talking about when, you, you know, when is it time to say what you think versus hold your tongue kind of. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And you know, there's always, um, there's, there's always those moments when you, when you figure, well, I got to pick my battles. But it isn't always about negative things. It might be about about positive things too. It might be you could start something really good happening if you were the first person to say, hey, you know, we should do X or has anybody thought about doing Y? And, and, and that's kind of what you did with this. You brought this topic up to me and you set something in motion. You know, there was no downside for you to bring it up in this particular case. <laughs> but uh, But then again, we wouldn't be doing this episode if you hadn't brought it up, so... So there's that. But that being said, I want to start this conversation off by saying that passion can ruin your life. <laughs> Bombshell. So many of us have some have some uh, things that we think are really important that that we really really wish were different in the world. Or I say in the world, it could be in your company, it could be in your lab, it could be in your industry, it could be in your university. It, you know, there's any number of possibilities where it is. And and so it really matters to you, but it doesn't necessarily matter to other people. And so if you get on your soapbox about this, you may find that other people just aren't signing up for it. And that could hurt your feelings. <laughs> You're like, why, does, why don't other people see how important this is? How come everybody else doesn't want to save the whales just like me? You know, um, or whatever it may be. You know, it, it could be it could be something, you know, very call it airy fairy, or it could be something really really substantial and and very specific. It's something measurable, something you feel like everybody should get this because we can put a we can put a ruler to this and know whether or not it it's it's a good thing or a bad thing. But the fact is is you just having passion about it, it's not enough. And if you just let your passions run everything, you will find that people will, will not respond positively. You know, occasionally you'll find folks that'll have a similar passion to you, but chances are they already had that passion. You didn't convince them to have it. And for those who don't have that passion, they're just going to look at you and think, this is some kind of crackpot. This is some kind of imbalanced person about this topic and 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 even if they don't go that far they might just go ah well you know that's that's just fred being fred you know we don't worry about that you know he he rambles on about this and 
and it goes in one ear and out the other, and you don't actually accomplish anything. So there's no value to you to speaking up in a situation like that. <clears throat> now, the other side of this, though, is that if you stifle yourself, that can ruin your life, too. If it's something you really care about, and you never say anything, and you just, and you just, you know, just stuff it back down every time that, that your concern gets challenged. Um, and often it's being challenged by people that don't even know they're challenging it. They don't, they don't even know that they're being a problem. Well, that can cause you a lot of harm. And ultimately that's gonna harm your career. If you are constantly feeling repressed, that repression, it's gonna show up in other parts of your work and other parts of your life. And you're gonna get to a point where you just, you just automatically circle the wagons. And you'll circle the wagons in, in situations where you don't need to and where all you have to do is say, hey, wait a minute, we should go this way instead of that way. And everybody would go, oh, yeah, OK, let's do that. You know, so you can't just cut yourself off either. Um, you, but you got to know when do I speak up? When don't I speak up? So <clears throat> I was listening to a, a, a podcast, uh, an interview with with a psychologist and, and author. His name is Ian McGilchrist, and he, he wrote a really fascinating book. It's called The Master and the Emissary, The Divided Brain in the Making of the Western World. And it, it covers that, that notion that, 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 that popularly understood that, that there's a two sides to the brain, and there's a left brain and a right brain. And the way it's commonly understood is that the right brain is the creative side and the left brain is the logical side. Um, but frankly, that is, a, that is a simplification to the point of getting the wrong picture. <laughs> it, it's not really how, how the brain works, in fact. And you know, the notion that the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body and vice versa is also not even exactly correct. It's partially correct, but not exactly. So there, there is one thing about it and that, that this book covers pretty well and is really important to recognize. And it's really important for you as scientists to recognize because so many scientists would be what we would call classically left-brained. That is, they're logical, they're orderly. And you have to be in, in the business of science. You, you've got to be able to do things in a replicable fashion and you know all of that would seem to be a left brain kind of task. But one thing that, that uh, Dr. McGilchrist figured out was the way the brain works is a little bit different than that. The division between left and right is a little bit different. And it goes like this. The left brain is focused on specifics. It's, it's, it drills down to the details on whatever you've got going on right in front of you. Whereas the right brain is more big picture. It's, it's seeing the whole landscape. And so you can imagine for uh, you know, an, early, an early mammal needed to know the difference between itself and food. And so when it got into some food, it needed to know where it was and understand where it was and be able to focus on that and make sure that it got the full advantage of that food that was there. At the same time though, it needed to be aware of the general surroundings in case there was a predator around and it needed to know the difference between itself and the predator. And so the right brain could always be there and deal with it, the uncertain world and unexpected happenings. Whereas the left brain is dealing with, here are the specific, I found the berries, I'm gonna eat all the berries, I'm gonna focus on the berries that are, that are ripe, you know. <laughs> That's the very left brain part of all that, that working on. So. If you can imagine, then you can have passion about something which could be, which could be a very left brain thing, very specific. But if you can see the big picture and say, okay, well, how is it going to impact my world if if I charge up this hill right now? You know, if I tilt at this windmill, what what's going to be the outcome? So that's something the other side of your brain can do, and and that side of the brain is the imaginative side, and we've talked a lot uh, in in past episodes about how important it is for you to have a strong imagination and for you to be open to discovery. 
And that's kind of a right brain thing, which goes against your, you know, blocking and tackling kind of everyday, very specific, make sure you do things in an orderly fashion, in a replicatable fashion, in a safe fashion, in a clean fashion, you know, all those, those left brain kind of things. So I'll pause there for a minute and see if uh, you have anything you want to weigh in on there, Nick. Well, apart from that's quite interesting about the the left and right the the left and right brain side of things. Um, yeah, but in in the in in regards to the speak up, don't speak up thing, it just struck me that again, this is another thing that we're talking about where it's a slider, it's a sliding scale. Speak up, don't speak up. And you, and you want to find the sweet spot for you. You don't want to be the sort of person who always speaks your mind or, or, or always, or, you know, is the, maniacally speaking out about what you're passionate about. But you don't want to be someone who doesn't, you know, who just stifles your opinion all the time. You've got to find the sweet spot. And, and you know, the more we go through these episodes, the more it's kind of striking me that this is like a life, what you're describing here is life's big mixing desk, if you like. <laughs> and... Each slide, each track is a, or each um, channel is a, is a different aspect of how you live your life, and and it's all about where, where do you, uh, about being aware that these are all sliding scales and, and getting a feel for where you want to be on each one. Right. So, yeah. And and, right now everybody's gonna get a, a gut feeling that they have about how comfortable this is that it's a sliding scale. For some of you, that sounds very uncomfortable. You'd like it to be very, give me a give me a formula, something that'll just be black and white that I can know for sure whether to speak up or not. Whereas others of you are, will like the idea that it's open and 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 subjective. And and the difference there is basically what side of your brain you're processing this on. If you're doing everything on the left, left side all the time and everything's gotta be, you know, to protocol and to formula, you're gonna find a very frustrating life ahead of you. Um, on the other hand, if you don't put any of that in place, you're also gonna have a very frustrating life. You can't, you know, you're gonna find other people, especially when you're surrounded by other people that are that are per- protocol driven. They're gonna have a very difficult time with you if you don't, at least some of the time, work within the boundaries. Um, so you know. Again, I'm, we're often recommending that you go outside the boundaries for the benefits of, of discovery and, and imagination. But there are times when you do need to you do need to play by the rules. You need to color in the lines. <laughs> and so, so let's think about this when it comes to speaking up. Um, there's, there's two things you can consider about anything you, that, you're, that you might want to bring up. That is, what's the cost of speaking up? And what are the benefits of speaking up? Um, and there's also a cost to not speaking up and benefits to not speaking up. So you know, you've, got a, you've got several different ways you can look at it. Sometimes one of those things is going to leap out at you. is like, this is so worth it to speak up about. I'm going to just, I, I don't care what the cost is. I'm going for it. In other cases, it's going to be, man, I will be so much better off if I just shut up, you know, and it'll again, it'll be so clear to you that it just it won't be worth the cost to 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 hang yourself out there. But um, you know that that's that's what we we need to look at. So if we if we first start off with the idea of okay, let's look at the cost of speaking up. So you see something, and you go, you know, we're really doing this wrong here in the lab. And and if we would just if we would, you know, get this better piece of equipment, we would solve this constant problem we're having all the time. And so then you think, okay, the cost of speaking up there. Well, you got to look at the cost to yourself. What's going to happen to me if I speak up? You got to look at what's the cost to the group. What's going to happen to you know the people I work with here? To, and you know, it's not just your peers. It could be your boss. You know, it could be other people that whoever's involved with your group there. And then you can look at what's the cost to the world if I speak up. Is there, will there be any harm done out in the general populace? Am I, get, am I really shaking things up here? Is this going to create a stir that's going to, going to cause a ripple effect that is negative? You know, you, you can process all those things and they don't always all apply. You know, 
whether or not you get a new flow cytometer probably doesn't impact the world. <laughs> Maybe it will. It depends on what you're trying, what you're doing in your lab, I guess. But you know, you can look at that, and and you got to look at things too. That just because you know, oh man, I would love for us to have a better piece of equipment here. That's really good for me, but that is going to be a big chunk of our budget, and boy, that's going to impact everybody. That's going to that's going to mean there's other things we're going to have to give up. And by the way, there'll be other things I'm going to have to give up. You know, so so you you look at those factors, and I hope your your career is getting to a point where the decisions you're making actually matter in the world. Where you can look at these things and say, wow, if we go this way, it's really going to make the world a better place. Or <laughs> if we fail to go this way, it's gonna, not going to make the world a better place. You know, or even do harm. You know, and it's, if, if you live in such a life, you have a rich life. You're, 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 you're making a difference out there. You're, you're doing something. And even if you find you are constantly frustrated, like, well, I see this. You know, I, I saw some, some, some meme that went around that basically said, you know, how many movies have you watched that were a disaster movie that, all, that started off with some scientist saying, we got a problem and nobody was listening to him. <laughs> so, you know, and maybe you're, you, you're in that kind of, um, kind of environment where you, where you feel like there's an alarm bell you need to, that you need to set off. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I realize recognizing that something could be really bad doesn't sound like fun, but the fact is if you're the person recognizing it and you can enroll others in recognizing it, you, you can really make a difference in the world. So you can weigh that in you know the cost of speaking up versus the, the benefits of speaking up. You know, the cost of speaking up might be that people are going to think I'm a crackpot. People are going to think I'm a zealot. Or maybe just people are going to think I'm wrong. <laughs> um, and, you know, you got to process all that. Decide whether or not that matters. And who else it might impact. You know, what might it impact the people you work with? Will it impact the reputation of, of your laboratory or your university or your company? You know, the, those are all things that you can process. But on the other side... You got to look at what happens if I don't speak up. What's the cost of that? And again, the cost to yourself might just be a little loss of self-respect. It could, it could be as simple as that, but that's not unimportant. If you feel like, you know what, I'm just a cog in the machine. Nobody cares what I think. Yeah, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm just beaten down here. I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, a slave at the oars. You know that's that's going to impact the quality of your work for the rest of your life. You, you're you're never going to be somebody who 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 is a great discoverer. You're never going to be somebody who's highly productive if that's the way you see the world. That you've just been that you've just been you know pounded. In, you're a round peg that's been pounded into a square hole. Yeah. So you gotta you gotta look at that. You gotta look at the cost to your group. You know, what happens, if I don't say something about this, something goes wrong, and then, oh man, it's, it, the whole group gets smeared with a black mark. It may matter. Or the world itself. You may, you may look and say, if, if I don't speak up about this, who will? And I can, I can give a little bit of an anecdote from my own life on this. You know, I, I've started many businesses in my life, and, um, and quite successfully so. And I got to a point where it was time to start another business. And I just couldn't find anything I was passionate about. And so I didn't do anything for a while. And then I, I had read so many books on, on entrepreneurship and, and on, on management. And, and I realized there were some things that I knew that I'd never read in any book. I'd never heard in any lecture or in any, in any seminar. And I realized then that I had learned some things that weren't commonly taught in the world. And I thought, if I don't start teaching them, when I'm gone, these concepts and ideas will be gone. I've got to speak up. So I saw the cost to the world if I didn't do something. And I'm just, I'm just somebody who does 
does you know management consulting <laughs> and i say it that way because you know what you're doing in especially in bioscience is so critical and so important and so few people can do it that if you've come up with something new and you never speak up and it never gets known in the world what a cost to the world that could be you know, so I've been reading an interesting book here recently. In fact, I should put this in the notes too. It's called The Body by Bill Bryson. And he's just, he has gone through and he's interviewed so many scientists and doctors and, and, and investigated so many just people who discovered things about the human body, which are amazing and fascinating. And some of them now are common knowledge, even among lay people like myself. But, uh, but some of them are they're only known to specialists, but if they hadn't been known to specialists, our world would have would have been really uh, it would have really cost the world a lot. There there have been and there have been people who seem extremely underqualified to discover things who discovered things, people who weren't good at what they did. <laughs> they they didn't run good experiments. They didn't do good studies. They 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 didn't know how. But they had passion about a particular topic and they learned things and they figured things out. So, you know, that's that's something to consider. So I, I have kind of two, in my mind, two kind of, what would you say, applications of this, if you like, or, or ways in which this kind of um, could play out, you know, this kind of phenomenon of speaking out or not speaking out could play out and, and you know, one of those uh, you see quite a lot is, um, you know, heated discussions, heated topics, like, um, you know, especially the obvious one is political topics. And, you know, you, people are very passionate about one end of the scale or the other or one cause or another. And, um, you know, they either, they can uh, either be very outspoken or just keep their mouth shut about it or, or somewhere um, in the middle. And uh, I guess one one of the things that you see, one feature that I notice a lot of 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 that kind of spectrum is that maybe just as important as as speaking about and giving respect to what you think is is actually respecting what other people think as well, because a lot of the times you see you know that morphing into demonising people who don't have the same opinion as you, um, and polarising. Um, of opinion, so that that's kind of like a bigger world kind of view of of uh, of that this kind of particular slider for me. But in, maybe zooming it back down towards more the, the lab set, set, setting. So we're talking about being a happy scientist here. So for me, the whole thing is 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 all valid. It's if it's the you know getting this right in the things that you care about in the bigger picture, but also getting it right in the the things that are going to make a difference in your career as well. If you're zooming it down into the lab, we've kind of touched on this previously, um, where uh, about the idea of putting your opinion in to the pot when you know when it's a lab discussion or when you notice something in the lab or something in in the strategies that are being used in your group or whatever that isn't right, and you can either speak out and um, speak out and and risk being wrong or or risk being right or or or, or not saying not saying anything and again i think i've mentioned this before but i think it's, it's it's a good one it was a pivotal moment for me but that first job i was in i wasn't the expert i could see i worked for a small company that was making a device i could see something straight away that wasn't that was that was a wrong direction the whole company was going in with the the basic strategy they were using and i didn't say anything for about six months and uh, because I didn't thought I didn't know, I, I, or I wasn't no, I thought I didn't hadn't earned the right yet to say anything, and um, and then I spoke up, and then that that became the change of direction. And it wasn't like a heroic thing or something; it was just a new pair of eyes on the problem. Um, but I didn't respect myself there enough to think that I had something to say there. Um, so it's interesting, actually, that in both those things that I'm saying that there that respect comes into it, respecting of other people's opinion and respecting of your own opinion and your own you know the validity of those right the, this notion of earning your right to speak up if 
if someone is about to get run over in the crosswalk, do you do you ponder whether or not you have the right to say to them, you know, you're you're in danger if you take another step? No, you you just take an action. And if you were wrong, it, you were wrong. But so what? It, it, you know, the, the, the potential cost of that harm was so great that you, you're willing to do whatever has to be done. You know, that you're putting, that, putting your hands on someone who's to push them out of the way might be something you would never do. You'd never push somebody. Uh, but in this situation, you just have to. And so ponder that sometimes, even, you know, when it's something, something that doesn't feel that life and death and go, do I, am, am I, am I afraid to be wrong here? Am I afraid to have somebody say, oh, you know, you just, you're not seeing it correctly? What harm would that be? What, you know, I'll use your example, Nick. What if you had spoken up months earlier and they had said, oh, well, it's because you don't understand. There's this, this, and this. You would have learned something. The, the downside wasn't really that great. This notion that you hadn't earned your right didn't really matter that much. And you could have actually gained something even from speaking up earlier if you had been wrong. <laughs> so, you know, and again, I don't want to beat you out about that. I no. think you've already taken yourself I to learned the that lesson. over it. <laughs> I definitely learned my lesson. And yeah, it was one of those. It's just one of uh, another kind of thing, you know, a pra very practical uh, way that that played out in another company that I worked for and I was a bit more experienced then but I saw one other a person in that company who used to encourage all of the everyone and you know when we had a lab meeting or a group meeting that you'd always have the, the wallflowers who wouldn't say anything wouldn't ask any questions wouldn't make any comments on what the, the speaker was speaking about and he had a, you know one of my colleagues had a great thing of making kind of a rule for all of his students that they had to ask at least one question and that kind of forced them to put themselves forward because when you're asking a question, you're implying that you know something about what's being talked about, right? And so um, it forced them to, to kind of get over that hurdle of being scared to be seen to be wrong. And, and I thought that was a great thing. It really helped people to grow and actually made the lab meeting a lot more enjoyable because I used to do it as well then. I was like, okay, so I've got to ask at least one question here and I'll go along with what he's saying. And... And it, and it makes you then take things in in a different way. And so that can be taken out to the bigger picture of what's your role in your group? Are you just a, are you just a doer? Or are you, uh, are you someone who's going to put in ideas, whether, you, whether they end up being the right thing or not? Or you're going to contribute in terms of innovation, or you're going to contribute in terms of um, opinion, or, or you know, whatever it is that drives the bigger picture of the, of the lab. That you're in, and it's the same in a relationship or a, or anything really. Um, it's well, what do you want to be, and and again, it's like so many of these things. The the um, the thing that stops you is the inhibition of you know fear fear of being wrong or fear fear of being seen seen to be less, and and you can train yourself out of that. And you bring up something else that's interesting there that you know just. Statistically speaking, probably most people who are listening to this podcast are those are the the worker bees. They they're not in a leadership position necessarily, but some percentage of you are. And are you encouraging people to do that? Are you encouraging people to ask questions and to bring up things and to offer opinions? Or are you squelching them? Are you stifling them? Are you making it you making it so costly for people to speak up that they never do? Well, think how much you're costing yourself. By, by failing to take advantage of that extra set of eyes you have there, so yeah, and so I mean, if you look at it from the other way around, you know, it's, we're talking here about, um, you know, when should I speak up? I, I you know, again, uh, going back to what I said earlier, that's about you respecting your own opinion enough to be have the the guts to to voice it, but also you could equal we could equally be talking about as from a management position from your the, you know if you're the group leader when should I allow other people to speak up and encourage other people to speak up? And that's just because if you think you're right all the time, you're so right that, that you don't want to hear other people's views on how things could be done or different or whatever, then you're just as, you're, you're, you know, 
and the tr and the truth is that you're that you're just as wrong as the person who thinks that he's never right and so doesn't speak up. And you know, part of it might be the look. I do, I don't want to be constantly be pestered by stupid questions or silly ideas. I, I understand. <laughs> However, sometimes silly ideas turn out to be really interesting. Or even if the idea itself isn't that great, it can spawn something else. So it creates opportunity for new discovery, and you know that matters. It's funny you say that because the you know the the thing I referred to earlier, the first company I worked with, and it was I didn't see the idea for months. It sounded so stupid, the idea, the alternative idea that I had. That that's why I didn't. That's one reason I didn't see it, <laughs> and it ended up that it, that it actually was the solution. And so yeah. Well, there you go. That made so, it more fun in the end, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, when a story like that that has a good outcome is great. But, you know, the fact is, I bet if you searched your memory, you could find some times when you didn't speak up and you never spoke up. And now you don't have any story to tell. <laughs> yeah. yeah, of course. Well, I'm only going to talk about the good ones. That's Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I'm saying even for ourselves, we don't remember those things, the, the things that never happened. We don't. We don't even know what we lost in those settings. And so, yeah, um, there was an earlier episode we did, episode sixteen, which is the challenge differentiating between science and scientific opinion. And we have to recognize that that as much as you may be dealing with science all day, it doesn't. It, it isn't all chiseled in granite. Some of it is opinion, and. And there are very, very erudite, intelligent, educated people who differ in those opinions. And so it's, it's really valuable to hear the opinions of other people that you don't agree with. And the, the converse of that is you are denying people value if you don't bring up an opposing opinion sometimes. It will, it's good for everybody, even if they don't change their opinion. Because it, if somebody hears the opposing view and it may may help them strengthen their position it, it may help them realize how the how right they are <laughs> and yeah you, know, you may think well gee i don't want to help my opponent do better well actually you do because at the end of the day i hope that what you are for is what is what is the most true what is the most accurate and even if you bring up something that's inaccurate if it, if it solidifies the position of understanding better what is correct, you have, you have done a service. There's still the upside opportunity there, even though you, you, know, you may not be in the winning side of an argument, as, as it were. And that, I mean, the, the same goes true then of you know, respecting other people who, you know, res respecting and listening to the opinion of you know, opposing opinions, you know, and, and giving them air and letting them be, you know, in the ether without, um, without demonizing them or, or, you know, without polarizing, you know, let, let, you know, you can agree to disagree and, and then, and be aware. I think one of the, when we talked about the, um, you know, the difference between science and scientific opinion is that I think we sometimes, it's quite easy to lose sight of the gap between what is a scientific fact scientifically proven fact and opinion and it's and uh, you, there are some and some people have a tendency to allow one to leach into the other well more specifically to allow opinion to leach into sounding like it's a fact because it came from a scientist and well, so that's right you know there, there used to be all disease came from the miasma you know it was bad air <laughs> but that was the that was the prevailing opinion but it was it was an opinion, and but it was treated like a fact. That was the best of our. I, I I was. What were we talking about last episode? It was what you don't know, you don't know. Yeah, and it, this occurred to me afterwards, and it kind of um, it kind of uh, resonates in in this context as well. And it was my high school physics teacher actually, who said that you can never say that something is isn't possible. You can only say that it's not pot. And he's talking about a technological advance, advances. You know, um, you can never say that something's not possible. You can only say that it's not possible with the current technology, and and I think that that re this this really speaks to that because today's scientific fact is tomorrow's 
oh well, it wasn't quite the way we thought it was. It can be anyway. And so you have to have a bit of humility in, in understanding that it's possible that even if it looks solid, that there's something that we're missing. Indeed. And you know, I, I came up myself in the Silicon Valley world and I saw the world turn inside out 20 times. And then I saw that start to be transferred to biotech. And, you know, companies like Genentech came along and some others that were being venture funded, just like software companies, which I thought was our special little niche. <laughs> Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> A whole new world has, has, has blossomed there with tremendous ideas. And, and, you know, even if you don't always agree with them, they are pushing forward the, the horizons of knowledge. And, and, and we're gaining from these things. And yes, sometimes they can be a little dangerous, but that's why we need people like you to be plugged in and speaking up when it's time to speak up. Yeah, people like all of us, we all have a we all have a viewpoint, and um, yeah, it's it's all part of the spectrum. <laughs> yeah. So, so one other little thing I wanted to bring up um, in in the show notes, you'll see a link to the the two books I mentioned, the Master and His Emissary and the Body. But you'll also see a link to the Jordan B. Peterson podcast. And you'll wonder, why is that there? Well, the reason that's there is because the reason I knew about the Ian McGilchrist book was because of an interview that that Dr. Peterson did with Dr. McGilchrist. And he's got a lot of great interviews there with, with some really, really interesting people. So even if, uh, even if Jordan Peterson is not your cup of tea, although he might be... Um, the people he interviews are really fascinating and that's the, he is one of those people that is he's a contrarian and he's not afraid to to go back and forth with somebody he's not trying to win points he's not trying to beat them he is trying to to open up the possibilities of understanding and i hope that's what we're doing here too and at the end of the day the more you understand the happier you're going to be it's it's running around confused and frustrated about life is does not lead to happiness <laughs> absolutely and yeah hopefully people um people uh pick up on these ramblings and can get something out of them i think that i think that i think that they will um you can so this episode is number 32 and as ken mentioned so the, you know the uh, outline of the t- the chat but also these links are in uh, the show notes, which you can get by going to bitesizebio.com forward slash the happy scientist and then finding episode 32 in there. Click on that page and it will be in the, the, the show notes will be in there. Um, you can also find us on uh, facebook.com forward slash the happy scientist club. And there you, you can um, yeah, you can uh, you can contact us and tell us uh, how amazing or how uh, how. Uh, unhelpful this podcast was we're open to all opinions you feel free to voice them <laughs> and <laughs> um and you can you know we, we'll be putting up other uh, other types of content on there as well that's related to this so if, if you find this useful then facebook.com forward slash the happy scientist club is the place to go uh and the last thing as always is a reminder to look at episodes one to nine if you haven't done so already and you find this type of content in, uh, interesting and, and helpful in the end we want to give you tools that can help to make you a happier and more productive scientist that's the idea um, episodes one to nine have some foundational principles in there uh, that are that you will find particularly useful in kind of resetting some of these or, or becoming aware of and setting some of these uh, these parameters that, that help you work more efficiently and and uh, in a more joyful way so you can get them at episodes one to nine. So again, Ken, thanks for another great episode and for speaking about, out about that. Thank you. And we'll catch you all next time. The Happy Scientist is brought to you by Bite Size Bio, your mentor in the lab. Bite Size Bio features thousands of articles and webinars contributed by hundreds of PhD scientists and scientific companies who freely offer their hard-won wisdom and solutions to the Bite Size Bio community.